All right, welcome everybody and happy Friday wherever you might be tuning in from. Um, <clears throat> yeah, excited to jump into a topic that I really enjoy, which is talking about the cloud. Um, I, I, I put out a poll on LinkedIn, I think earlier this week, and just kind of wanted to get a sense of what you all are interested in. And the cloud certainly came up to be one of the topics. Um, so that's what we will be talking about today. Now I'm I'm testing a new mic, um, so just let me know if that's working, not working. If the audio is good, I usually use one that's like closer because I move when I talk a lot. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to be a little more, uh, you know, stable here and just use this and keep connected that way. So um, that's what we'll go in from. And uh, yeah, just uh, in the chat, I normally ask everyone to say where you're tuning in from. So if you wanna throw that in, uh, that'd be great. Um, just let us know where you're uh, joining from today. But I also was actually gonna say, um, you know, if you wanna throw in what tools you've been using or what's the last geospatial tool you used like recently, I think that'd be uh, cool to share. So what was the last thing you used? Um, <clears throat> anything else you wanna share? That'd be awesome too. So yeah, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So today we're talking, like I said, about cloud geospatial. Um, or GIS in the cloud, which is certainly a, a topic that, you know, I think is one that is obviously important. A lot of technology is moving to the cloud. And there's a, a great video that I really like. Uh, it's by the founder of uh, Postgres, the, or actually the creator, I should say, um, talking about like the 10 big data pointers. And pretty much everything in there was like, you know, we're definitely moving to the cloud, right? We're, we're going into the cloud and uh, doing a lot of things there. So um, it's an important topic. Uh, obviously, as things move online, you have to interact with the cloud in some way. But it can be tricky because how do you take these projects that you've built locally you know, like on your computer or something like that, and then move them to the cloud or make them ready for production. So today we're going to break down some different topics and we're going to uh, kind of walk through a few different pieces here talking about, you know, what is the cloud really like the from the building blocks of it all the way up. And we're not going to talk about a specific one specific cloud. Of course, there's lots of different cloud uh, providers you can use. The, the big ones are, of course, Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure. Um, so those are some of the big names you hear in terms of like cloud infrastructure, right? And you might use different types of those yourself. So, you know, lots of different things you, you could choose from and, and things like that. But what we want to focus in on is like the core components that you'll find in any of them, no matter what you choose, and then how to use them. And there's a lot of stuff we're going to ignore. You know, there's, there's plenty of tools you can use to build applications, do chat messaging. There's like this whole AI thing that we won't really get too deep into. So we're going to focus on like the geospatial infrastructure, like data you know, analytics, spatial data engineering, um, and then we're kind of like even GIS topics that you'll be working from. So cool. Um, yeah, awesome. Great. Thanks, everyone uh, joining in. Good to see everyone. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, really cool. Lot, glad to see a lot of people using Longboard, Geoparquet, um, and literally from all it, it, it's really cool to see where everyone joins in from, like all over the world, which is wild. So thank you for taking some time out of your day to be here. So I'm gonna share a document I kind of put together. I kind of try to keep it simple today to just run through a few different components. Uh, let me just get that up and working here. And I'm going to move over into the white mode, of course. Bring that out. And it should work. And let me just get this. There we go. Okay. So I'll make this bigger so you can see it. I can drop my video for now. Um, but this is kind of my core elements of like what is in the cloud and, and cloud GIS, as it were. So we'll start up here talking about what I would call cloud primitives. These are like the base building blocks of things, anything in the cloud, really. And this is, you know, things that most people interact with, like starting with storage, like that's where you put your files. Um, you know, the, the common ones are S3 for AWS, there's Google Cloud Storage. So it's basically just taking a file that's on your computer and then putting it somewhere. So it's kind of you know, putting it there and, and doing some different things like that. So that's really all that it is. Um, it's just working from the storage side. Um, let's see. Oops. What just happened there? Uh, and now we Okay, we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. So those are the the kind of core elements. It's like, okay, 
you know, these cloud primitive tools that we're building into. So that's like these cloud pieces. The next is compute, which is basically like the, you know, your CPU on your computer that runs processes, like you're opening a command line, you're subverting something there and you're using the CPU or the, the processes on your computer. That's doing that in the cloud, right? And then the other ones are databases, of course, that's, you know, like Postgres or MySQL or anything like that is, of course, having access to a database for storing or transacting with data. So that's like the other big piece. Now, what's important to note is like, I think AWS was really the ones who pioneered through this, I could be wrong, but um, basically turning everything into its own container service, right? Now, a lot of applications pre-cloud, uh, all this would be compiled into one server. So on one server or like your computer, you have your file storage, you have your compute, and then you have your databases and maybe an application that runs on top of all of that. And in your traditional GIS world, that's kind of how things work, right? You have uh, files on your computer, you can connect to a server, uh, you have your desktop application, and then that application uses the compute infrastructure on the computer. What the cloud does, it keeps it all in separate services. They can all talk to each other, but they're all these individual parts and pieces that just, you know, stay in their own group. So you can use what you need, nothing more, nothing less. And then it charges you based off of those specific uses, right? So if you use one part of storage, it'll bill you for that and go forward. Um, so that's really how this works. And, and most things build off of these three pieces. You know, the, the majority build off of compute. We'll talk more about that compute infrastructure in a minute, but that's what that is. So that's where we kind of start into these cloud, cloud primitives. Um, let's talk about storage first. Um, that's any file you go on and download online is stored in storage somewhere, right? Um, that's cloud storage, you may even download a file and you can see like, oh, it has a Amazon endpoint or a Google Cloud API, something like that. That's coming from a cloud storage service and most images you see online or things like that live there. Now, if this is like the first foray into the cloud, this is where I would start. It's super easy to basically take files that are on your computer and move them into the cloud, which they can be then shared or distributed and used in different places. So that's like baby step number one, to take your files off your computer you know, you know they're going to be secure there and then bring them in as you need to to your other services and you can connect to them remotely even better, right? So if you connect to them as an endpoint or call that URL, that's not clogging up space on your computer for files. If you ever run out of file storage, um, I certainly have because I'm just sometimes it's just easier to click download and do it there rather than, you know, put it the right place in the cloud. So, you know, remember that is that that's something that, um, you know, so that removes a burden on your computer and moves it to somewhere else that it needs to be. But the second piece is, you know, we've talked a little bit about these cloud native file types, GeoParquet, uh, Cloud Optimal, GeoTIFFs, things like that. That's where these really shine is actually putting them in cloud storage because it, it allows them to be kind of remote. You can see them there. You can do a lot of different things. And that's really where they they shine. And we talked a little bit about this. Um, let me just flip to my other screen. I'll just do the entire screen here. So flip back and forth. Um, when we talked a little bit about source cooperation, so source cooperative is that's effectively what this is behind the scenes, right? Source cooperative is a cloud repository in one of these different data sets, be it cloud optimized GeoTIFF, be that um, you know GeoParquet, whatever that is. That's effectively what that is running behind the scenes. So if we, let's just click on one here. We can look at. Uh, let's pick up two. We'll go with this, and then if we can find like a master file type, let's see if we can find something here. And then, Doing. These are just the featured ones. Let's see. I don't know if COG is the right thing to search. But let's just start with cloud optimized. This is the Google buildings combined uh, by Vita. So it has you know two billion buildings. So right right now you probably know it's going to fit in memory on your computer. That'd be really difficult to do. Just pump this in the cloud. Great easy first step. And then you access it through. This is effectively what it looks like if you open up AWS. You see these folders, just like folders on your computer, and you can store basically anything. It's also called blob storage, which I find odd. Uh, but you can store anything, even tiles. And this is PM tiles, which allows you to view a tile set. And you can post this. You know, it's 193. It's not a small file. But you can take this and actually just copy this URL. And, uh, let's see if it works. I did not plan to do this, but this is PM tile viewer. I can just grab this in my remote URL. Um, I have to get, oh, doesn't look like that one's going to work. I might have to get authenticated. So um, sometimes you have to access the data. 
like credentials and stuff and they can go there. So I might've had to do that or pass that in. So but that's the other part we'll talk about security. Security of course is a big reason why companies move to the cloud is because they don't have to worry about that. Um, but you know, this is what you do, you get these keys and stuff, but we'll, we'll cover that in a minute. But effectively that this is all that's here it is, you know, optimized file types and things like that. Um, and the fact that when you have cloud optimized geotiffs, it allows you to take advantage of the uh, sort of reading over the wire so that that you know, HTTP request, let's say you have a giant global raster and you just need to extract a few points or a few areas. That's what the cloud optimized geotiff is really good at is saying, I know you need to be in this area so I can discard all this other data and request and just focus here and just use that. So that's what cloud optimized geotiffs are really good at. We can get into those later, but that's why storage should be like, almost a no-brainer first step that you take. So that's what storage is. And like I said, it's just like a file system. Base step number one. Number two is actually running you know, compute services in the cloud. So imagine you have a command line when you actually open up you know, uh, you know, a Google uh, compute engine or EC2, AWS. It's basically like a blank, right? it's totally blank. It's just giving you, you know, Linux or Ubuntu. You can spin up the, the things of your choice. And you can scale it to have as much storage if you want to have some storage there. But the whole idea is that you can your storage in cloud storage and read that from the compute in and out. It's installed the same cloud, it can do that really effectively. Um, but if you need, like, you know, compute in terms of CPUs or GPUs, you can scale that up to as much as you want. And that's kind of the, the beauty of all of this is uh, let's just Google and see. So these are like, there's so many different sizes you can choose from. Secure. This is just for Google. There's general purpose, storage optimized, compute optimized, memory optimized, so on and so forth. And you can see all the different types and then what comes with each of them, right? So if there's probably like a detailed listing here. So you can see you can have this many CPUs, here's a thread or core, here's the memory that can come with it, so on and so forth, and all the things that you would you know, do within that. So you can scale these up to really large machines, right? If you, I mean, imagine if you had on your computer, like, you know, your CPUs, you had 176 or, you know, uh, 224 just running in the background. And that's, that's pretty wild, right? So that's something to just keep in mind is that you can actually skip all that up. Now, of course, this, these cost money, right? Um, you have to turn them on and off. So if you turn them on, you'll be billed. When you turn them off, you won't be billed. Uh, so you have to keep in mind that, okay, the cloud is, these are businesses, that's what they do. Um, but yeah, that that's the good part. It's really blank. Which is I, mean, like, I don't have, like on my computer, I'm using a Mac, I have all the Mac OS stuff in the background. Uh, if you're on Windows, you have all the Windows operating system stuff. There's just literally nothing right there, which means you can install what you want, but there's also nothing to start from. So you have to start from the very beginning and, and build within that. So it's good and bad, but basically this could, those compute servers are the backbone of anything else you're doing, right? That's the backbone of what you know, the compute your databases will run on. That's uh, for your notebooks, that's where they'll run. Uh, even Spark tools. So you'll see those letters and codes be in AWS or in GCP in lots of places, right? So you can see where those come from. So those that's where compute runs. Compute is a, is a great tool. Um, like I said, it's, it's literally just a command line. Uh, Google, let's just see what we have here. Uh, this is basically what it looks like when you open it up. Um, just see. You can connect to it from your own computer where it can open up and basically it's just like, uh, this is a good example. It's like a command line. So um, it basically shows something like like this, right? Um, you can connect to it and then do stuff with it. So great, great thing to do. So you know, if you need that extra, we'll talk about how to choose between these things and, and what to do in a minute. So I just want to lay it out now. Uh, there was a quick question. Um, so uh, what are the tools for creating workflows, data processing pipelines, OSM, CSV, or JSON? We're talking about question we'll talk about that in a minute and i think um the second most popular topic is actually doing elt pipelines which is another one i'll talk about so i think that's probably spin off of some other pieces here too so you can be like a, a one two. so very good question hopefully i can answer some of those things here um, as we go through okay so let's keep moving so there's a few other pieces to get through bases these are databases like i said mysql postgres these are services that exist so they're kind of like pre-built databases already existing um, and then you can customize them to some level you know there's you can customize some things but if you wanted to include like a foreign data wrapper which is like a data connector to other pieces that becomes a little tricky if you want to 
connect to you know other things or build some specific components in there you have some control but not you know and, and a good example of this is you know some of the a lot of the postgres services come with Postgres, which is a very popular extension so it'll come with that but it might not come with complete routing so you would be kind of out of luck there unless you want to do this yourself so there's other extensions that you might want to use so if you know what you need you just need post gis or something like that for a, a postgres database they're really good out of box where you kind of click deploy and things like that now, there are some extra pieces you know you have to manage and things like that and we'll talk about managed services and why those are important um but that's kind of like a, a first it's literally just a database but it removes some of the headache now, I saw some people who were using, <clears throat> excuse me, Jupyter Notebooks, and that's great. Um, Jupyter Notebooks, you can run in services there too. And basically, you just you know, spin up what is up here, a compute server, and then the cloud handles the creation of the notebook in the background. So it just runs that one chunk of code for you. So it's, you could literally take your code and put it in the cloud. What's nice about that, and you don't have to authenticate connected files in cloud storage. So it's a little bit easier just to say, oh, I don't, you know, I'm already in the cloud. It sees that I've logged in. So I don't have to, you know, add these security roles, which are always tricky and fun to work with. So it handles the setup and you can kind of choose the compute size that you want. Now, we'll talk a little bit about compute, but like choosing where to deploy your compute is a really important thing. Um, because like, let's say you have a notebook and it's like this really long running process. It's taking forever, it's crashing. You could just put that in the cloud and like give it more compute and it would probably run faster, but then it's, you know, you're kind of paying for that. And it's kind of like a good way to do like a simple thing, it certainly works, but um, there's other ways to optimize bits and pieces of your workflow that were maybe more efficient and things like that. So that's another component there. Um, so those are notebooks. You run the basically the same service in the cloud, and then they have other services around that too, AI services or machine learning services or things like that. There's lots of stuff, but it basically it's like your Jupyter notebook in the cloud, and that's kind of it. So, um, data warehouses. So, data warehouses. Um, I, I think we have to get like an illustration of this, or um, yeah. So, this is <clears throat> from the scene of Indiana Jones. Um, I don't know if, if anyone's seen this before, but there's basically this giant warehouse that they bring this box. To, and I don't know if you can see this. Uh, and then, you know, the guy brings the box there, moves it around, and it zooms out. And, you know, it's, it's just this massive warehouse of other crazy artifacts that might be. Um, that's kind of how I think about a data warehouse um, in reality is like a data warehouse is like where you just put all your data. Like if you have, that you may imagine a really big thing where you have logs of data or chat records or transactions or stuff like that. This is where you put all your data. To keep it. And it's there whether you need it or not. Sometimes, sometimes you may not, but it's large data, right? It's keeping those records to say, you know, at some point in time, I want to compare how are my sales are from uh, this period of time over the last 20 years. You know, you could do something like that. And it's basically allowing you to store it for very cheap. I said another part why I say storage first is like storage is becoming commoditized. It's pretty cheap to do. So, you know, if you are running on a budget or anything like that, you can store data pretty quickly. And, a nice thing um, and there's even some free tiers with these clouds that you can get access to so uh, that's something to keep in mind but it's basically you know allows you to do that now the data warehouse component allows you to store that and then when you need to analyze it it spins up lots of compute to do that and spreads that across those workers so it's two components serverless and the, the, the term serverless basically means that it will start running the compute at the time you need it rather than running all the time. So when I spin up a compute instance like these over here, what I'm doing is I'm spinning up, running until I tell it to turn on. What serverless does is say, oh, there's a job happening. I'm going to grab the compute that I need or I think I need to run that job appropriately. And you can put controls on that and things like that. There's different approaches to this. But I'm going to grab what I think I need and I'll run it. And if I need more machines, I can grab them or I can spin this across. But in parallel means it takes that process and splits it up. So it's running instead of something like 10 minutes, it will split it up into, you know, 10 chunks and it'll take less, it can split up to 100 chunks. So it doesn't really matter. The, the machine does that for you. So what's great about these is they're like very ready out of the box. You can just go in, data warehouses um, are 
that you're looking at are Google BigQuery, Amazon Redshift, and Snowflake. Um, Databricks kind of works like a data warehouse, kind of this concept of a lake house and uses some Spark infrastructure, but I'll count it in that as well. But it's, it's really different, but not really. You know, there's a thing that, that's a good debate if you want to talk about that. But basically, that's what they do. Now, they're growing quite a bit more than just warehousing. They added machine learning capabilities, AI capabilities. Um, you know, some of the stuff we do at Cardo is like actually creating map tiles in the warehouse and, and doing some different things. So you can develop and grow on top of them and basically use it as a very large data infrastructure. But they're really meant for like those kind of analytical uses, as I said at the beginning. Um, they'll have geospatial capabilities as deep as hostess. So they may lack some functions, but the core of the really important ones that you'll be using are, are generally there. But it's, it's good to do those like really you know, big analytical functions that you might want to do. Um, so if you do like aggregations and you do that at really large scale, the warehouse is a great choice. That's kind of where that that fits in and things like that. Now we're starting, the, as I got into notebooks and data warehouses, we're talking about separate services from the cloud, or sorry, the, the, the you know, primitives within the cloud. So these are kind of services that take bits and pieces of these primitives and make them into the services these would use, just like a database kind of would. But, um, and effectively, you know, it's like taking a notebook, which can deploy from some sort of process, and then those three need to run that, and then you use the cloud storage. So it's bucketing these things together to make services. Now, what the advantage of these services are is that they're more ready to use. You're not like building from these from scratch. You know, I, I, I guess you know the, the best way to, to look at that is like uh, a cloud primitive would be literally, you know, making you know a, a piece of furniture from raw materials almost, right? You have all the materials and you can do it, it's gonna take longer. Um, and then as you get more advanced, some tools are more like Ikea. You have some building to do, but you know how to get there and you have something to do. And then there's some services that are kind of like oh, ready to go, right? And that, that's kind of out of scope for what we're talking about today, but it's almost like buying a piece of furniture, like bringing it in and putting the legs on, right? You, there's way more built out for you to use there. So, and then as you move up that chain, things may become more expensive. It depends, and, and that's all. But yeah, data warehouses kind of are that ready to use service, big data analytics. Security, you're going to come across a term called IAM. That's uh, identity access management. <laughs> it's very important. Security, of course, uh, nobody would move to the cloud unless all their stuff was secure. And security from everything from you know, encrypted data, uh, you know, back data. All the way down to physical security, disaster recovery and spillover. Like if there's a disaster in this one cloud region, then they have backups in different areas to who's going in and out of these places. I mean, there's that covers all that security. But I, at any access management, it's like it knows that you, with this key that you have, have you know specifically access or do this thing, right? And it's important because like you, know, you can give everybody every access, but you want to control what that is. You can see where those things are running costs, and it's a lot of work to these. It can be kind of painful to get the key and the right roles and all of that. The cloud wouldn't work without this. So it's like, you know, you, you love it and you hate it because it does deal with stuff, but it's also, you know, it's a lot of work to do as well. So just that's security. You'll come across that at some point. Um, serverless is another term I kind of defined it like, you know, basically it's like, oh, I, I know I see you have a process. I'm not going to move, and I'm done, I'll, I'll stop. So it allows you to scale that quite quickly and just for the time that you need it, right? Which is really nice because you're not going to pay for it running all the time. You're just using it for that brief period that you're renting it. Um, and there's Lambda functions or cloud functions are like a good example of this um, within uh, AWS and Google respectively. It's like a very small snippet of code that runs, you call it, and then it shuts down. So it just gives you that it's not running around the clock. If you deploy an API, it's running around the clock. So that's uh, there's other tools to run longer running processes. I actually this is uh, snow data. It's a, it's a raster data set that's updated daily. So I wrote a script, Python script, basically pull that, transform it, prep it, and push it into uh, into Cardo by a BigQuery, and do all of that work. And it basically triggers and it says, hey, at 1.30 every day, because the data is updated, go do this thing, and then shut down. And then it just does that. And hopefully, I won't have to think about it again for a while until it breaks. So, um, but yeah, that's a nice good example of server. Now, there's other things, Spark, which is, of course, you know, the big data processing system. You can run these clusters in the cloud, which are basically groups of compute, right? They're groups of compute, and it puts uh, you know, the Spark infrastructure on top of that. And then you can also have containers, right? Now, containers are um, 
Docker containers, the you've heard this before, containers are a general term. And containers allow you to run a blank box of something, whatever that is. It's totally blank. It does not know what's in there. Um, and then you give instructions on what to do. You know, run this Python or run from Ubuntu or run from this. And it will only do what you tell it to do, which is because it's not really about. Once again, all that other stuff. But what's different from compute is that you're basically starting it from scratch and that it allows you to port that to anyone else. Like I can send you that same container. If you have the right infrastructure or if you have Docker, you can do the exact same thing I did and basically know what's going to run. Right? With a VM, there's other considerations and things like that. But uh, it can get complicated in orchestration. Like there's a whole ecosystem for doing Kubernetes and all the stuff that orchestrate these different tools. So it's something to keep in mind. It can get complicated, but if you're doing something repeatedly and you want it really custom, uh, containers are the way to go. Now, when we look at kind of like managed services, um, if I can make this bigger, um, but this is just something that I've been putting together. I think I posted a while back. Looking at like the modern geopark. Of course, there's different pieces here. These cloud services that I talked a little bit about and cloud file types. And then you have open tools, of course, like GDAL or PM tiles for creating map tiles here, um, H3 and DBT for data transformation. That's in the ELT topic we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, but there's also cloud services, right? And, and managed services on top of that. So BigQuery is kind of like one of those pieces of the cloud as is much like a Redshift. Um, but there's other tools that kind of do some of this for you. Like other um, is kind of like the, the serverless version of DuckDB that helps scale that. Crunchy data is like, a really great choice. They focused on Postgres and doing it really, really well. So it's like they handle a lot of the stuff you might want to not want to do, which we'll talk about today. It's like, you know, there's backups or networking or all these other things that are very tricky. They have very easy way to one click deploy and then they have other pieces they wrap around that. There's a great support for Spatial there too, which is cool. And then uh, platforms. So we use Cardo today. Um, obviously, I, I work for Cardo, but we'll, we'll talk about, you know, what that is because. We, we consider it a managed service. We run in the cloud and uh, we handle a lot of the other stuff for you when it comes to connecting data warehouses, um, you know, writing and creating tools on top of the databases or data warehouses to do different things, things like that. And then uh, others like Whereabouts, which is the commercial like managed service of Apache Sedona Fused, which is um, you know kind of like creating a serverless backend for different uh, you know uh, functions that you can write in Python and scale those very quickly. It's a serverless backend. So you can see where all these things come in. And you know, for mapping from belt or open source like Longboard or Kepler GL, all those pieces when we talk about a managed service, they're basically doing something that goes beyond just these components in the cloud. Right? They're taking them, they're handling some level of it for you, and it's basically taking some of that and take off. And when we talk about that, is there's three decision points I like to think about when I'm working with and when I'm orchestrating a process, right? So when we're, we're doing these different things, there's three things to think about. One is that uh, you, the two factors you want to focus on is where is your compute running and how what are you spending time on? Right? Your time is a very valuable resource, but what are you spending time on and how are you doing that? And then where's your compute running? And deciding where you want to spend that resource. Compute is like a very valuable resource. And, you know, it's almost to be think of it as like, you know, kind of uh, constrained or limited that will help you make these decisions about where you want to do that. So, you know, that's one thing to think about. Storage is easy and cheap. So I kind of said, think about cloud storage is a really good place to start. Um, and then, you know, like I said, deciding on time and like level of critical pain to use these different services will help you decide what to use. So if I'm trying to use, let, let's say, uh, say I have a process I need to run one time or maybe a handful of times, I don't want to over-architect. I don't, I don't necessarily maybe need to spin up, you know, a full database or something here. I can do that with different tools. I can even, you know, write a, a notebook and scale that to the cloud and say, hey, you know, since I'm running this one time, uh, it might not be the best idea just to throw more, you know, compute at it in a notebook. But since it's one time, that might be a good choice. You know, I can get it done, get out of my way, and move on and forward. But if you're running that over time, then you can say, is this is the database an appropriate place for this? Maybe is it the data warehouse? Is the data volume enough? How much data is going to come in? Those are some decisions you can start to make. And from a serverless side, it's decided to say, is this something that is going to be happening repeatedly, but I don't need to spit it up all the time. I just need it when I need it and I need it available. So I need to be ready for that and going from there. So those are some different considerations you might have in terms of choosing these different services. So what is the time it's going to take? 
how painful will that thing theoretically be and which services do you want to use? So that's kind of the, the different parts that you want to decide on. So um, if there's any other questions, let me just do a quick scan here. Um, okay, good question here. Uh, seeing reimagining to hybrid merge networks are overgoing, uh, leaving or creating more of a buffer from the cloud. So there are some of these cases where people are like looking at these hybrid setups. You know, that's something as sometimes if you get really big, you know, like you have massive stuff, and like that may be a solution is like if you have some sort of on storage and you've already invested in that, um, there's a there, you can certainly use that. Like you can your compute and storage as a resource, right? It is a resource. If you have, you know, how much you have, what you really need it there for, and where you can put those things is a very important thing to think about. It's like, where am I? It's it's all about kind of balancing cost and access and all these things. So you can certainly reimagine like you know, yeah, it's, it's, this thing is just on my server and my team needs access to it and you know it, it can sit there and I'm not going to have massive updates. Great. There's you know, something that a lot of people need access to. Obviously, you can go into the cloud. So it's it's like I said, these are we can talk more about this in the future. It's deciding okay where where are the places you need to put that time and energy? What makes the most sense? like that. Um, that's a good question there. If there's any other questions, uh, go ahead and pop those into the chat and we'll go from there. But let's talk about uh, the what we'll showcase today, which is a very quick demo of taking a Postgres database on my local machine and bringing that into the use case here is uh, let's imagine that uh, I have a very custom Postgres setup. Postgres setup and I want to have extensions um, that are readily supported from some of these services. So in this case, for me, that's PG routing and H3. So I want to have those in there. And the good news, and this is the it's the same Docker container I use in my book, is uh, it's from a group for Toza, which I believe is in South Africa. Um, and they do amazing work creating these pre-built containers that are ready to use. Like so, you know, it's so easy and I like it's, there's so much engineering that went into that. So if you know them or anyone knows that, give them a shout out because like that that thank you. <laughs> um, that makes these things very easy. So you can literally just go grab that container and it gives you what you need. And I have the option of saying, okay, I want H3, I want PG routing, and there's other stuff you can do in there too. I think there's like point clouds and, and all that stuff. But let's say even I want to customize that more. Maybe you wanted to have a foreign data wrapper. Um, you know, you can have a, for a specific connection. Um, you can even have foreign data wrappers to DuckDB if you want. So there's there's lots of other pieces there too. Um, and then, you know, I, I have these things that are, are requirements for, for me to run my project, right? So that's something to, to consider, right? It's like where do you put these efforts? So here's the process we'll go through. And we're going to use, like, I wanted to do this to show you from the base, like, cloud primitives, where to start and how to scale that up. So the first step is to pull that Docker image and, and build it. Now, you don't have to necessarily build it, uh, but it allows you to do that. And that's step one. We're going to then take that image and register with artifact registry, which is a container registry in the cloud. So you're going to register it there and then push that image into the cloud. So it's going to be sitting in that cloud service. Now, why we're using an image is because of that code reproducibility, portability. It's easier I could write that all into like a, a startup shell script if I really wanted to for that, container, for that compute service. But this is just, it's, it's ready to use. It's so repeatable. I'm like, I would almost push you to go there just because but basically, within that compute engine service that we're going to be using, I can actually say on start, you load this Docker container, and Docker is installed there, so it's ready to go. And then you're going to do a few things. We're going to add some arguments about telling it how it should start. Um, we're going to add a value to that, and then we're going to start our compute engine service. That means our database is up and running. Of course, that database is in the cloud, and, and it's locked off from all extents and purposes. So we have to add firewall rules, which is you know um, another thing when we think about networking. That's another components. So you think of all these steps, right? What happens when you need to update this? What happens if you need to change something? All you have to go through these pieces. And, and teams spend a lot of time and energy about like this or whole orchestration process. You could probably call this DevOps if you wanted to. But you know, this there's this is one way to do it. Otherwise there's managed services and that's kind of why they kind of say you make it easier for you. So you can at least see what that is. Um, and then you can connect to PG admin and then we'll connect to Cardo, make some maps. Go on our way. So that's the uh, the demo for today. 
So the first part I mentioned is actually giving access to that. Right? So if you download Docker, you can do this on the command line um, and you can do this in the web as well. So we'll just put that, um, oops, wrong window, post GIS Docker. And this is the, the one you'll look for. So you can see it on GitHub here, it has all the information going from window to window. Let's get to the right window here. Zoom in a little bit. So this is the, the, the tool and you can see here's the Docker file that basically defines what it wants you to run. So it tells you all these different stuff. You don't need to know this in detail, just telling you for, for transparency to see like what's running there. And then these are some other files that will come along with that. But you can see here uh, to get the image, you can just pull this directly from Docker. You can pick the version that you want and all these different things. You can self build it right there. And you can see it's on the Docker hub here. So I can really find that. So on, they publish these and many other images that you might want to use. And this is, you can use these locally too. I literally just pull it, I tell it to run, and it runs. And I have a Postgres database on my computer, which is awesome. But we want this to be in, in the cloud. So you can see some of the things that it sets up for you to do here. So there's out of data, there's automatic support for rasters. Um, you know, it has, uh, include routing, uh, H3 and all these different things. So it'll tell you what you can do here. Like I said, a lot of other images as well. So they have a server, like, uh, they have the LPG backup, there's you know, Docker OSM that you can create them here for OpenStreetMap, GeoNodes. There's like a lot of stuff that they've done to create these containers. So kudos to them because that makes our lives a lot easier as well. So that's what we're gonna do. We pull this image. Um, I built it, you can see it, it's, I used the Docker Compose version here, but I can see it here, it's running on my computer. And what then what I wanna do is our second step, which is push this into um, the, oops, that was the thing I think is my code. Uh, ah, it's up here, okay. So this is kind of the code to do that. The first thing I need to do is basically, um, Let's just zoom in here so we can all see this. Uh, I need to figure out where my like Docker container is, is running, a name of that, right? So what I'm doing here is the first few steps. I'm gonna, of course, authenticate with the cloud. So I can do that. I might, you know, like prompt you to log in or do that like a Google thing. It depends on what you're using in this case. So I log in, authenticate, and I'm connecting and configuring for this region within Docker. So this US Central run is actually shorthand for a physical data center that I'm going to. This I think this one is in like right the Council Bluffs, Iowa, if I'm remembering correctly. So the, you know, there's a whole map of these if you want to see where they are. They're all over the world. So you can pick one that's close to you wherever you want to do this. Or you can put in multiple. Just you know, it's up to you. So that's the, the, the beauty is the choice. So what I want to do is I'm going to create a new artifact repository. So in G Cloud artifacts repository and create my art I'm just called post GX H3 Matt. That's my repository name. Um, and then I'm going to give it all of this format. Docker. The format is for Docker, and then here's the location. Here's my project ID, which I want to share because that's important, private. <laughs> um, and then what you want to do is basically see where your containers are running. So if, if I run, let's just clear this out. I run Docker PS, they'll tell me here's all my containers. You can see the names of the ones I want. There are two running live right now. And this is that one I want, that Docker PostJS 15-3.3. You can do that. I think you can do some of this with the image that's hosted on Docker Hub as well. Um, so you may be able to skip this, but since I want my specific things, I'm going to do it this way um, and go from there. But what I do is I tag that image and then basically tie a local name to this code for where it's going. US Central One, that project up here, the project the container name, so on and so forth. And I push it up to the cloud and then I basically check to see if it's there. So what I can do here is just say, is this impact running? Uh, actually, I can't run that code, but everything, um, not in my So anyways, you can lift that up and you can go into the, the database and run that. So that's step one. Once that's up there, um, you'll actually be able to see that that's you know, in, in, in an actual image. So if I go here for my images, uh, I don't know where that one is, but it's, it's basically there. And then this is where I'm gonna be starting my kind of compute structure. So. Uh, this is a compute machine. Um, I'm spinning up a compute instance. And the key here, I followed this demo, so I actually probably can show here, is basically how to put this onto your own Postgres onto a compute instance and go from there. So I see up, go for the commute engine, you can create a VM for this virtual machine. You can 
use the size this person's like trying to do this as cheap as possible so they're using one of the smaller machines which is e2 micro so it's six dollars a month um and then you can basically pick the size but you can go from teeny tiny up to as big as you want so you can kind of scale and see what you want there so it's really up to you to, to pick what you want. i mean if you go up it increases a little bit here and there so that's that's a few though but the key is that you can actually deploy a container into this image so this, this it starts it will deploy a container now this person does it from the marketplace from you can actually search for that and get this url our url is basically what you saw over here which is going to be this and say what that is so we would drop that in here and go with that and then you're going to add your arguments so our arguments in this case go back over here are the things i wanted to do um where are you uh so you can see i have a bunch of arguments here and if you zoom in that's what i'm doing so i have the passwords and stuff like this to actually allow me to get access this and, and now you can actually tell it you know, here's my extensions i want to show here's the path that you want to do and then you actually store most importantly you want to store a volume so the volume is an external data storage piece that will store outside of that and this can store anywhere you kind of want it to but that allows you to say if i shut that down it's not going to destroy my volume data so shut it down and i know that that data is stored externally it's kind of like the database of, you know volume which is more of a docker thing than anything else Shut that down. If you finish it down, the data goes away. We don't want that. We want persistent data. That's what we'll do. So we have this volume in there, and that allows us to do that. And then um, you can do all those pieces. And then if there's some other arguments here too, there's other things, security stuff like that. I hit create, and my instance, as you can see here, has a nice green check mark that says it's running, and I'm running, and I'm happy with everything's good to go there. Um, and you can actually like authenticate to this and check that's running. I'm not going to do that. security. Of course, we want to be secure here as we do things. So um, the next to do firewall is because it, it, you have to basically it's going to block everything unless you're running stuff like, directly within that cloud. So we want to connect to this from our local PG admin. So I'm going to create some very specific firewall rules, which is I'm going to name it. I give it a tag. So I'm going to create a firewall rule that says this. This is like where we get into the security piece. You can allow it, and you can pick these IP ranges. So I picked just my computer. There's only four IP addresses that can access this thing right now is it's my, my computer and there's some that are specific to the Cardo application. So that's the only people that can get into it. They can only access it. Nothing else. There ain't no other traffic can get into this. So once again, a managed service does this for you. You, you know, they, they handle all these extra things that you may or may not want to handle. And if something goes bad, they're there to help that too. So that's kind of the, 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 the set of like why you would choose a managed service like that. It's, it's how much Headache, how much pain do you want? That's up to you. And that, that, that's the beauty is you get this up. So, what we can do now is actually get into our instance. So, I created this, right? I have all these pieces set up. My database is live and it's running and I have access to it now. So, what I did, of course, our first step is to connect from PG admin. Where are you? Here. So, I enter my credentials. Um, I basically, properties. Here and my connection to this use a, a remote or sorry, a, a public host name that I can access with the URL. Give it your name, password, all that stuff, and then I'm connected. So, right now, if I just do this, and this is my connection here, and go select, we'll go st set srid and st make point, and we'll just do a nice point at null island. I can hit run and uh. Oh yeah, here we go. I didn't need an argument that would help. So okay, so now I have this that has sent that query off to my database in the cloud and brought it back very quickly. And as you can see here, I have a point. Great, that's what you know, exactly what we need to do. My last step is to load in some data. So I just used just as I would locally, just as just the exact same thing. It's this kind of the same data we use in the, in the book that I put together. Is I'm just going to load that data with those same arguments using over to over on my command line. So instead of a local host, I'm using this host. Um, and I can load my data here. I'm going to load the NYC311 data, push that up, and it's at this table name here, NYC311. And if I can find my windows or keep myself organized here, I can just do this select star from NYC311, 
their GM is not known. Oops, hold on. So if you run that, I've run that. And this is now that data is up in the cloud. It's on that database that's running. And I can see my data here. I have, this is, their database is up and running. You've done everything you need to do to have a live database, which is great. So that's kind of the, to get there, you can use very primitive, basic building blocks. I'm building this from the ground, from the scratch and going from there. Um, is that the way to do it every time? No. So I just want to caveat that, but I wanted to show you from like the basic building blocks. So now what I want to do, I actually want to see and we'll, you know, create a nice little map like this, you know, in Cardo. So what have I done here? I just, you know, I can connect in and you can see, I can use a managed service show that I can have a connection to inquiry or these other you know, tools here. So if I actually want to do that, um, I can actually connect to the and then I have that connection at the managed service. There's all those other pieces that come with that. Um, right now for this post, just I'm, let's just review. I'm in charge of the security, the networking, the backups. I didn't do any backups yet. So this thing can fall, like, and depending on the volume that's stored, I don't have any snapshots. I don't have, the list goes on about things I should be doing in this to like make it really production ready. It's very cool. I put this on the cloud. Great. Now you have to do all these things, you know, for who, uh, you know, the list goes on, right? It's, it's great. I've done this and I'm happy with it, but basically I can set up connection here and I'm just going to type in the same things I have here. I can create my name for this connection, the server location, username, password, database, um, and then I can encrypt the connection. Great. The ones other things you get with, you know, service, like I'm creating an API around the service, you know, or a piling API or anything like that. Who's doing your SSL? <laughs> Who's doing all that? You know, letting someone in that can can have some. Value. So it's just what parts of this do you want to hand off or not, or things like that. Are what they consider. All right. So I've created, and then we can actually go check this out. Now you can connect this database to anywhere. I, I chose to use Cardo just to like have a different piece to it. That's a proof. Like, hey, I actually have H three cells and put those on a map just to show what that looks like. So that's uh, you could connect this to Puget, or you can just you know able to that. So uh, let's go to the data explorer here. Um, that should be one of the most the most recent tables we'll take a look at. It's that I'm in the basement, so the internet's not always the best here. But. And then, yeah, so this is my most recent table I looked at. Um, I can actually go and I should be able to see my actual connection here. So if I go all the way back up to the, the top, here's my connection. So here's my database, GIS, just like I drew it up. Um, and then I have my different uh, you know, database uh, kind of IP in there. Yeah. So then we go to public, and then here's my data, just like I wanted it. I have a few different tables in here. So the first one was this NYC 311 data, which is the direct data that we just uploaded. Um, I had to add a geometry column and take that in from a lot long. So a few extra steps there just because of that. But you can see I can actually uh, do a few things. You can see this is 3.2 million rows and there's 3.6 gigs. Um, and I, there's actually an option to like optimize my table. It wasn't optimized, so I can actually do that here. Um, you can see the data here. It's the uh, here's my latitude and longitude. Uh, since I loaded it with uh, OTR, as a spatial index, big bonus. So I don't have to do that work. So if that's already on there. Um, and then what I want to do is maybe I can go to my optimized table. So what I did is I let Carter do the optimization there for me. I can do the data preview here. See, here's all my data. I have my instant time was created, stuff like that. Um, why is this doing that? I'm not doing that. Uh, so then, yeah, so that's what you can do here is build the pieces. So any data I do, and if I upload the same thing as I upload data from here, I can go directly to my database. So now I can load it over and over. I can try to drop whatever I want to do. Got a lot of options here. Um, so let's jump back to PG Admin. And this is kind of the cool part is that I can communicate with this database here and pump it up to the cloud. So what I want to do um, is, and what I originally did is, let's just see here, let's throw this again, is I want to add this column for the H3 cell. So specifically for my requirements, I had PG routing, but I also want to add in H3. And I could add in a raster file too, if I need to, which is really cool here. So let's add H3. So what I would do here, if I still had our stored function-wise, so I'm going to first uh, forget this for now. I'm going to alter my table. So this is that table, that optimized table, I'm going to add a column H3. And it's specifically uh, a variable character. So it's, I could add it as text, but that's like a variable length. So I want to keep it, I know that that's going to be 16 characters every time. Let's just save on some space there. And then I'm going to update that and I have that function already installed. So I have that 
in, in extension enabled, ready to go. So I can say H3 to lat long cell, centroid geometry, and at level 12. And then you'll see here, we have those are H3 cells. So jumping back to Cardo, I'm going to create a map from this. Um, I'm just passing in a query. Now, there's a bunch of null geometries, and like not every record has a latitude, longitude. So I don't need to query those since they're not even going to show on the map. So what I can do here is say, okay, run this query directly to that database. And then uh, the first one, if I want to see my points, so let's just do that. Um, here, let me think I just restart this. We'll run there, and then we'll see the raw points themselves on the map. And then we'll pull that in and render. And I've done some operations to make that load a little bit faster. It's, uh, it's still pretty quick. It's still post shift when I'm running it on a super small machine. So this is like not at scale at all. And it's trying to render like three and 3.9 points. So there's things that are, you know, will take longer here. But yeah, here's my data on a map from this thing. local Docker container all the way up to the cloud. I got exactly what I wanted. Uh, but this visualization, it's not for me so let's i can immediately just say hey now i just want to use h3 cells so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to write this for h3 and then um let's see from i think there's a specific call component type um, so with the h3 and complaint type we'll run that and now i always when you're querying just query the type that you need if you don't need more than that you don't need to and then here it is because this supports h3 rendering natively it's just ready to go and then boom we got a map and what i'll do is we'll just change this so uh you can do by the most common complaint type here which is the in each cell and i'll add that in my uh, legend so you can see here here's the complaint noise residential noise and as we zoom out it will re-aggregate and recalculate and do those things so it's just you know it, it's a nice way to interact with that so i think the gray means that there's other complaints there let me just change the color scheme a few more steps, you know, like eight or ten. Yes, yeah, so we get a few more colors in there. See that pop up, and then here's all the different types. You can see here's the most common complaints. Now I could query this again by date. I can do all those different things. Um, let's see if I, you know, want to add another filter in here. I can go there and do a little. I think a time series might be a string. That's the only problem. So not for today. Yeah, I order. Of course, I put the uh, created date as a third. Screen. So once I get that up to you look at I'm sure it's stuff like that. But everything I mean we kind of went from database into you know on my machine, loaded our Docker image, you can just review the steps here again, uh, push that into this artifact repository, <laughs> tied to the compute, added our added a volume, started the compute engine, added our firewall rules, got it connected locally, got it connected in the cloud, and now we're up and running. So a lot of steps here. Like I said, I like I said, I wanted to show you how to do this with these cloud primitives, right? To, so you can understand that. If you want to skip steps of and go ahead of that, you know, you could move into a new database with you let go some control. You can use the warehouse and you let go some of the control. So those are all things to kind of keep in mind. Um, we'll get into more of these pieces as we go forward, like you know, serverless tools. Can you just run some analyses and pass those off to the cloud or moving data and creating a question here that I think is totally applicable for like these data pipelines. I think we showed this earlier, but um, you know, if you want to create pipelines and move data back and forth, uh, there's a few like levels of rules that I would apply. Starting at like a base of you know just using cloud storage and cloud file types and things like that. Um, you can process you know, these data sets or files with you know tools either locally or in the cloud. Um, and if you need to move them into databases, maybe that's a good use of a compute structure, you know, spinning it up for that short period of time. I mean, that if this is something you're doing over and over, using a serverless tool to do that and doing your code there is, is, is a great choice. You, know, you can just have it when you need it and then it scales down. So we'll talk about some of those decision points. It's a lot to kind of offer today, but this gives you like the, the base of like what's in the cloud, what you can use, um, how you use it. So that's that's uh, those pieces. I don't know if there's any other questions uh, that anyone had coming in. But you know, I hope this was helpful to give a range of what you can do in the cloud and uh, uh, what you can kind of check out. Use. I recommend just kind of if you can sign up for an account, put them some things in storage. A really good way to get started is with like Source Cooperative. That's like it's it's just like using the cloud for cloud storage, so it's super easy to use. And then you can look at other database services if there's you know kind of some things you want to try or to replicate this or this process or things like that. You can certainly do that too. So we'll kind of talk about the decision, you know, how to use the tools, 
the next time I think you know, with the next big topic will be LP, which is like basically a data pipeline. How do I take from raw data into database and then where should I transform it? Like you gotta transform it somewhere in there or do some things. Where should that be and how do I orchestrate it? Well, that's what we'll cover next time. So that's a good topic. Um, yeah, uh, this will be on YouTube and LinkedIn. So it just lives there in perpetuity. So you can see this. Um, so definitely check uh, that out. And yeah, thank you again, everyone, for joining. It always amazes me how many people are interested in this stuff and, and want to learn. Um, and thank you for joining from literally every corner of the world from you know, Lagos, Malaysia, Burkina Faso, uh, you know, Denver, Netherlands, Nova Scotia. Um, but uh, let's see what else we have here. California, Charleston, Cypress, Texas, Austin, um, Mauritius. I mean, and uh, thank you, everybody. It's great to be to have you here. So thank you again. Enjoy your weekend. Um, play around some cloud geospatial tools. Uh, shout out Kenya. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll see you around uh, for the next time. And uh, appreciate it.